going to explore the topic of hedonism and in particular uh, Epicurus's concepts around it. Hi Bear, welcome. Hello Kenny, or Kenix. I prefer, I wonder if you prefer Kenix. Hello Loki, hi Nick. Hello, hello, welcome. I'm just getting started. I am planning on having a discussion about the topic of hedonism and then in the focus of Epicurus. Is anyone aware of what hedonism is? I'm going to give it a few minutes before I get started exploring the topic, but feel free to discuss if you have any idea. Kenix, you're saying no, no idea what hedonism is. You've never even heard the word before, I would assume. Nick, have, I'm assuming you might have heard the word hedonism before. Thanks for the like. Yes. <laughs> like, where are you going with this? Uh, right, right, because that would be the question. What, what direction am I going with this? It looks scary. Why does it look scary? You feel like the the horned the horned being is scary. Is it part of the word? Is what part of the word? Part of what word? It's a mentor. It is. Could turn into a thirst trap. Okay. You're, you're challenging me to see what, hmm, to what extent I'm capable of managing the stream as well as entertaining ideas. So the horns and hooves remind me of the devil. All right. Well then. Perhaps, perhaps there's some of that idea of connection between devilish things. <laughs> the devil is my father. Kyle, is that because you you feel like your real like biological father is evil, or <laughs> because you have some sort of philosophical alignment with Satanism, <laughs> Loki? Pursuit of pleasurable experience with yourself and like-minded people. That's a pretty good general. Mm -hmm. Loki's saying uh, selfish pleasures and motivations involved with, right, doing things for your own pleasure and gratification. Even indulging to the point of overindulging is hedonism, right? Kyle says I'm a Satanist. Okay. So interested in what that means to you, because I've explored lots of different people's ideas and philosophies around what Satanism is to them and why it is that they feel aligned with those ideas. And I'm curious for you what it means to be a Satanist. Uh, Kenex says, creepy. Mortal Josh, hi, welcome. Josh, do you know what hedonism is? Producer, do you know what hedonism is? And where do you think I'm going with this conversation? Maybe if you knew who Epicurus was, maybe you would. Producer doesn't know what hedonism is. Hasn't heard of it. Natural powers. Um, I mean, I guess it's our utilization of our power. It's more about how we're doing it, like what we're doing it for. Hi, Asta. Oh, that's fast. Yeah. Just as I was consumed by it, I'm ashamed to say. So feeling like you were overindulging in pleasurable things. <clears throat> Maisie. 
Hello, hello, welcome. I haven't really gotten deep into any discussion just yet. We're now just exploring a little bit the what hedonism is by definition. Hello, Luna Wolf. Maze. Anyone feel free if you are aware of the what what hedonism is, throw it in. Guidance by and spirit. Nope, nope, it's not. Not at all. It's not a spiritual concept. Well, I can't necessarily say that. Hmm. You're right. Uh, it could be. It could be, but it also could be looked at as a harmful thing, too. Right, like Josh is talking about. Zero balance, right? Chasing pleasure all the time. Pursuit of pleasure, self-indulgence, yes. Maze has got it. Uh, Google says the definition is exactly that. The pursuit of pleasure and sel sensual self-indulgence. Uh, and you know what actually motivated me to do this stream? I had done a few weeks back a stream on self-care and what I found was there was very few people that actually attended the self-care stream and out of all of my my live streams that I save um, it's the one that probably gets the least amount of listens as far as uh, self-care being something that and even within the, the discussion we were talking about how self-care is believed to be something that you should feel guilty for it'd be like selfish to do things and this is just a, talking about the basics of taking good care of ourselves physically mentally spiritually and also doing those things that bring us joy and make us happy right we're just talking about it from the perspective of self-care and people are like no 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 i don't want to look at self-care i don't want to talk about self-care i was curious what happens when i shift the word into the word hedonism right where it's no longer about just taking good care of ourselves and giving ourselves the things that we need that are going to bring us joy and happiness when all of a sudden it becomes this, well, uh, what, there's some sort of, uh, what is the, the word? It's, it's like some sort of trigger word associated with hedonism. And what is it? What is it about hedonism that goes beyond self-care that makes it an even more intriguing topic than self-care? <laughs> Interesting question, right? Hedonism is a school of thought that argues that seeking pleasure and avoiding suffering are the only components of well-being. Very basically. Seeking pleasure and avoiding suffering are the only components of well-being. If we can avoid suffering and align with pleasurable things, then we will be well. Our lives will be well. Regardless of any of the other external factors, hedonism is just focusing on the bringing of pleasure and well-being, freedom from suffering. And somebody could say that that's sort of pretty much the same thing as a focus on self-care, right? <laughs> Avoiding suffering, right? Self-care to be able to try to avoid suffering situations and seeking the pleasurable ones. And like that focus on being well as a result of self-care. And there's lots of different debates about this, but we connect it with historical um, times. Um, you can think of there's art that really represents the, the hedonist uh, mentality or perspective. And it's ancient art from like um, ancient Egypt or even some of the more classical, you know, schools in Greece. You have... Uh, often depicted like people are laying down and just gorging themselves on all sorts of foods uh practically naked right they're just uh and that was a thing that was very uh specific about hedonism it was uh the the place of uh just everything that you could do that's luxurious brandon i'm not taking any uh live calls right now uh 
but um, generally I don't take any live calls from anyone who I don't have regular interaction with. So right now I'm talking about a topic. You can feel free to join our conversation about the topic if you'd like in the chat first. And maybe once I get to know you, I'll have you call in. <laughs> Hello, my dendopio. Is that a hedonistic satire? Very well could be. So does anyone have the um, connection, can make the connection between the background picture and the idea of hedonism? From... I don't know what MTG is. Oh, Magic the Gathering. I see. For me, it was a reckless pursuit that allowed me to eventually figure out what I want and don't. Card art. Right. So the symbolism associated with the devil, right, is this temptation to do things for pleasure. Right. So when we... Um, the, the devil and the tarot card is absolutely just represents that. It represents those things that we're tempted towards that bring us pleasure, but often can also bring us pain and su suffering if we overindulge or we, if we become so attached or if the things that we gain pleasure from end up taking control of us, right? So what does hedonism mean to me? Magic the Gathering? No, no, it's not. I think Dionysus when I hear hedonism. Okay. So, we see the story of Dionysus. What does it mean to me? It, it means a, 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 somebody put a label of a word on a bunch of different ideas. And I'm sharing with you. <laughs> I didn't make this up, so I can't give any other perspective other than what the conceptual ideas are that have been attached to the word over history. You want me to come up with my own definition for it? <laughs> uh. Okay. I want to see, didn't all the Seta work under Dionysus? I don't know that much about the Dionysus um, story. Loki, the horned one, lives a life of leisure. His only pursuit is his need to indulge his desires. Right, yeah, there's nothing more to life other than just relaxing and doing whatever it is that brings him pleasure and that's what you can see if you swipe right with the chat you can look at the picture closely and he's got this very self-satisfied look on his face he's just like liking life and not really caring about anything else but just consuming and feeding his compulsive and animal desires asked a very yeah yeah playing uh, set of future and myths like Orpheus, is Orpheus. Yeah, feel free to share more about these these other stories and where they might connect to the idea of of hedonism. Got the archaeology of hedonism. Dionysus, the ancient Greek deity of wine and a sort of all around god of good times supposedly only uh, or supposedly often manifested himself to mortals in the form of a bowl thus Dionysus might be considered the original party animal uh, but he's not nearly as in interesting as the women he attracts of the innumerable rituals by which certain different people worshipped him, none were more fascinating or fabled than the countryside gatherings to which the Athenian women would biennially steal away. Dionysus' female devotees were called the Bacchae, and they were... Um... <laughs> so, yes, orgies are another aspect of hedonism, uh, historically. Let's see... 
Orpheus was a tragic character. His love had died. He went to the underworld. Hades said, go back, take your love with you, but don't look back, right? He turned just as he exited the cave. Reason varies, and yeah, she she disappeared. Or did she crumble? Is that what happened? Yeah, I remember. Some say a satyr had killed his lover, chasing her to a den of snakes. Varies. Uh, do you know of Fantasia, the old one, the movie, the old movie, the Disney movie? Mm -hmm. Some say a satyr had killed his lover to write them. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, um, are we are we here to make some sort of subjective judgments about such things? Um, I wasn't intending to, but if that's the question, is um, is hedonism subjectively good, subjectively bad, right? I think um, maybe I had given some insight into that when I was talking about my opinion of self care and that connection between how eagerly people will prioritize focusing on self-care or whether or not they're willing to prioritize hedonism type activities or behaviors right like i think that self-care is really important and where is that line between what is hedonism and what is self-care is right hedonism ends up being the going overboard right And when it, when it becomes unbalanced with regard to how healthy it is for you to be interacting with that particular behavior in that quantity or, um, I'm going to change the background picture really quick. Cause I had seen another one that represented some, So if you swipe the chat to the right, you can see what is there. Uh, much like the character earlier, I could relate to his struggle through samsara. Right, yeah, so that's exactly what the story was earlier in the Zen stories that I was sharing. There was a story called Samsara where the guy was focusing on, yeah, that's he made this conscious intention to go as deep into hedonism as he possibly could. Just like everything in this world, anything that's beneficial to your state of mind, your body done. Liz, hello, darling. How are you? So, you right, we can see. Um, there's some of that art. You can actually see some of the, the one on the left in the middle is some of the the traditional art that's depicted these times in history where there were um, hedonistic values and were, were, were very prominent, right? So you can see it even within the lower one too. And then on the top left corner, you've got like the BDSM stuff, which is like going that deep into, and I think it's about the depths to which you're going. Uh, the top middle is... Uh, substance use, right? They're smoking and drinking and like that would be drug use or stuff like that, the indulging. Uh, the top right, obviously, that's all of the ways that we consume in, in the foods, g gaining pleasure around what we're eating. And yeah, the bottom right is more just like orgy stuff. So you can see how a big chunk of that is about, you know, sexuality and sensuality, um, but then we also are adding in the substance use and the foods. What other things do you indulge in in a hedonistic way? I did that when I was 19. Moderation is a good thing. Hedonism has a label of being extreme sexual practice. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, Des. Hi, Dalton. Mixie, chocolate. Okay. Mixie says, excesses of amounts of sweets would be considered hedonistic. Hello, hello. Let's see. In the original Old Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was written soon after the invention of writing, Siduri gave the following advice. Fill your belly, day and night make merry, let days be full of joy, dance and make music day and night. These things alone are the concern of men. This may represent the first recorded advocacy of a hedonistic philosophy. <laughs> Howdy. Challenging. Am I challenging a church? No. Are you? Hello, Loki. Could the analogy, if it feels too good, it must be bad for you to apply here? Well, again, those are subjective judgments. Too good, too bad. According to who, according to what, right? You've got the, the yin and the yang, where sometimes right actually ends up being wrong and sometimes good ends up being bad. When we live in colliding polarities, it's hard to make those type of judgments. Rock, there's a whole philosophy based in hedonism. Those that practiced were known as libertines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Scenes uh, in ancient Egypt, scenes of a harper entertaining guests at a feast were common in the tombs and sometimes contained hedonistic elements calling guests to submit to pleasure because they can't be sure that they will be rewarded for good with a blissful afterlife. The following um, is a song, um, I don't know how to sing it, but I can read it, attributed to the reign of the pharaohs during that time. Right is wrong, then I should go left. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, let thy desire flourish in order to let thy heart forget the beautifications for thee. Follow thy desire as long as thou shalt live. Put myrrh upon thy head and clothing of fine linen upon thee, being anointed with genuine marvels of the gods properly. Set an increase to thy good things. Let not thy heart flag, follow thy desire in thy good. Fulfill thy needs upon earth after the command of thy heart until there come for thee that day of mourning. Right? So that, that energy of um, live, live fast, die. Right? Like the, that same... You're, you're going to die, so you might as well. And you don't know what's going to happen next, so you might as well just enjoy what you have as much as possible. Mm. Loki, it also seems that people who were in favor with the gods were rewarded with a hedonistic lifestyle. The Romans would be considered a great example, I think. Right, live fast, die young. Right, I don't know that they were necessarily wanting to die young, though, but it was more that idea that... Um, like, indulge while you have the opportunity, because you never know what's going to come. And then there was a number of different schools once uh, we moved past into more uh, classical schools. There was the Cyrenaics from the 4th century BC. And... Yeah, these, they taught that only intrins intrinsic good is pleasure, which meant not just the absence of pain, but positively enjoyable momentary sensations. Of these, physical ones are stronger than those of anticipation or memory. They did, however, recognize the value of social obligation and that pleasure could be gained from altruism. So for those of you who aren't aware of what altruism is, that's basically this understanding that by helping others, 
we can actually end up doing good for ourselves because we often grow stronger or we have more opportunities for good things for ourselves with the support and of other people. Lucky that you make a good point. Mm -hmm. Let's see. They also thought that we uh, can know with certainty our immediate sense experiences, but can know nothing about the nature of objects that cause these sensations. And that we, they also denied we can have any knowledge of what the experiences of other people are like. It's all purely subjective. Painful, indifferent, pleasant, according as they are violent, tranquil, or gentle, entirely um, individual and can no way be described as constituting absolute objective knowledge. <laughs> Interesting. So... Moving forward, I think I'm going to change back to the other picture just so no one gives me a hard time. I don't want to have things be too overtly whatever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Conceptually, we understand then that um, that pleasure seeking is probably not a bad thing generally in aligning ourselves with pleasure, um, aligning ourselves with the self care that we need in order to avoid pain and suffering. Right is is really important, and um, yeah, finding our joy, finding our passion, doing things that excite us and make us feel good about existing is is all really valuable um pursuit right so we can't judge pleasure seeking nothing risque nothing gained in this right um yeah i don't know that there's anything wrong subjectively wrong with pleasure pleasure seeking but then it ends up being what are the negative consequences of uh overindulging hedonistic desires and then we get the things like addictions and um, unhealthy uh, b behavioral compulsions and all sorts of things that lead to negative consequences so there would be that subjective judgment of um, bad or wrong or just not good if a person has kind of tipped from just the pursuit of pleasure and the pursuit of passion um, to now start having negative consequences in their experience because of the overindulgence aspect. And that's where I think hedonism gets that bad rap because within the scope of hedonism is addiction problems. But I wouldn't necessarily say that all people who align with hedonist philosophy are addicts. Right? Like, I don't know that it implies that you must overindulge. Right? That the philosophy itself is more just that um, avoiding pain and aligning with pleasure is what brings wellness. Like, that philosophy as a whole is hedonism. And then, yes, what can happen in the extreme of that is like, no, sometimes it doesn't happen that it goes in the direction of wellness because of things like addictions. right temperance moderation right like we need to be able to balance out the um the experience of those pleasures and that sometimes existing well particularly existing in the world right where how often can we actually live fully just aligned with our pleasure most of the time we have to do all sorts of things that make us unhappy because we live in a world that controls us a lot more than we control it so I don't know how many of us actually have the freedom to be able to go out like that satyr. That satyr. Satyr? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Sitar? Sitar? No, that's a, an instrument. 
<laughs> anyway, anyone, I don't know how much you feel like you could actually just go out and live the life of that. I think I kind of do, but um, I got bored. I got bored with it. And I think that's where we can start to shift now into looking at uh, Epicurus and Epicurus's view with regard to hedonism, which is uh, uh, still hedonism, but it's a different form. And I, I think I can relate to this because I have existed in that hedonist place. I've followed my bliss, right? I I left the world that was controlling me and that was keeping me in all of these restrictive um, patterns where I wasn't able to do what I wanted whenever I wanted. And I found opportunities to break free from all of that so I could just live the life of that character following their bliss. And I did it for a while. And then I got really bored. And I felt like it didn't actually feel meaningful after a while, just indulging in whatever, you know, pleasures, traveling around and seeing beautiful places and going to wonderful restaurants and just live, living a life of comfort and just consuming and absorbing. But I wasn't feeling like it was meaningful. Uh, so enter Epicurus's conceptualizations. Uh, let's see. Um, blah, 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 blah. You stay in control of chaos. So are you outlining modern day current hedonistic characteristics as it applies to our culture? Am I? Sounds like a case. I've been to paradise, but I've never been to me. I've been to paradise, but I've never been to me. Oh, that's great. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. And looking, I mean, we could connect connect um, modern day hedonistic characteristics. I mean, we could tie in um, just the way that people overindulge in materialist things, like um, the ways that they adorn themselves with clothing and makeup and jewelry and all of that. The different things like the um, expensive cars and yeah, there's so many different. Uh, ways that we can indulge oh your connection sorry to hear that based on your experiences till you got bored yeah i think that's what it was it was i just felt like i was, that's all i was doing was consuming just going around and looking at beautiful things um and eating wonderful things uh but I didn't feel like I was making any impact actually doing anything or benefiting anyone, right? Like, that's the downside of hedonism. Like, you're not actually giving back in any way. You're just feeding yourself. And that's what it felt like. It felt like for a period of time, that's all I did was just feed myself in whatever ways that I felt like feeding myself. And that wasn't just physically with food, but feeding myself with entertainment, feeding myself with beautiful scenery, feeding myself with fun, entertaining things that I was doing. It was just feeding and it wasn't ever, um, yeah, making any bit impact, doing anything, uh, influencing the people around me in any way that was beneficial. It was just all about me, right? So... I'm I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do it because I have now been there and I've done it and now I know that I wanted for something more beyond that. You just like to read. Just like to read. I do or you do. <laughs> oh, my my passion comes from the impact that I can make, the people that I can touch. The, the lives I can change, the right words that I can say at the right time to make a difference, that's what really, really makes me feel good. That's what makes me feel um, truly aligned with my, my pleasure, right? So at that point, just feeding myself wasn't even pleasurable anymore. I got bored with it. So then it was like, where does my pleasure really lie? What do I really actually get pleasure from once all this material stuff and consumer stuff is not bringing me pleasure anymore and that's coming back around to the alignment with purpose meaning some sort of mission right uh let's see i am looking at an article called hedonism holds the secret to a happier life 
but not for the reasons you think. And it's by an author uh, by the name of Olivia Goldhill. And I found it from QZ.com. It's just a website that I'm reading from. But I felt like it was an interesting article when it's talking about Epicurus and taking hedonism, but also looking at it through a different lens. And I just need to pull my computer in. There we go. Hello, Chris. Thanks for the light, by the way. And Rosetta and Bruce, hi. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to share this. Would you mind spelling that in the chat, please? The website, QZ, the letter Q and the letter Z.com. Oh, Epicurus. It's actually at the, the top. It's the name of the stream, Hedonism and Epicurus. Mm -hmm. As a former type A person... I firmly believe that most type A types are failing at life. They've opted for an utterly miserable existence, working in unrewarding jobs that make them unhappy and stressed and take them away from their loved ones. A type A life is largely without leisurely novels, adventurous travels, or hours at the pub with friends, and all because pleasure has been rejected as a worthwhile goal. Hedonistic philosophers knew better. This school of thought holds that pleasure is a good worth pursuing and that the ideal human life is filled with pleasure. Today, the word is colloquially used to describe a life of self-indulgence and sensual delights, but in ancient Greece, the hedonist worldview did not necessarily descend into a life of gluttony and frivolity. Frivolity. Frivolity? I don't know, I've ever said that word before. Frivolity. Frivolity. Frivolous. Frivolity. I didn't even realize that was a word. All right. So, wherefore do we toll? Weren't life not made of song? Right, frivolous. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there are several branches of hedonism in philosophy, and one of the most well known, advanced by ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, ultimately advocates for a rather simple life. Uh, Epicurus's version agrees that pleasure is the greatest good and the best life is the most pleasant life, but he thinks the highest pleasure you can achieve is the absence of pain. Once pain has been removed, you don't increase pleasure from that point, you just vary it. Say that again. Once pain has been removed, you don't increase pleasure from that point, you just vary it. Far from feasting copiously, Epicurus was content with bread and water, which prevented him from starving and so abated any pain. He wasn't opposed to the occasional indulgence, uh, one point writing in correspondence, send me a little pot of cheese, that when I like I may fare sumptuously. But once he'd sated his hunger, he thought no greater pleasure would come from actively seeking more elaborate dining. According to Epicurus, you need to stop desiring anything you don't naturally need. For Epicurus, a hedonistic life is one free from bodily and mental pains. Most people live miserable lives because they're so worried and anxious, and so the key to Epicurean hedonism is eradicating all anxiety. Perhaps the Epicurean lifestyle of bread and water doesn't sound particularly hedonistic or appealing, but his thinking on how to eradicate pain contains a nugget of insight that's worth applying even to our radically different lives more than two millennia on. According to Epicurus, you need to stop desiring anything you don't naturally need. Inspect those things you desire. When you find there's something you desire that's either unnatural or unnecessary, then you should recognize that and stop wanting it. Epicurus certainly took an extreme view. He decided he needed very little, and a life without such desires gave him the greatest possible pleasure. 
but his emphasis on assessing wants and desires is useful for those who adopt a less strict Epicurean approach. If you think about modern stresses and desires about status and consumerism, there's a lot of what we might be able to do without, or there's a lot of that that we might be able to do without and probably would be healthy for us to do without. A lot of people work too hard because they think they need a salary increase and they think they need a salary increase because they need a new iPhone and that sort of thing. It's easy to fall into false beliefs about what matters based on the expectations of those around us. Hedonistic philosophy helps to puncture those views and reminds us what's truly valuable. True pleasure, far from being frivolous, is the ultimate indication of a life well lived. And that's the end of the article. Mm -hmm. Right, so that in my own experience, right, like I was explaining, that it became less about what it was that I was able to um, take in and take for myself and, and more about that recognition that a life well lived for me is much more about what I do and how I impact than what it is that I feed. Hello, Kronos. I've been talking about this for about 40 minutes. It's saved as a stream. I don't think I can go back and explain it all over again um, for you just joining now. But it is saved as a stream. So if you're really interested, you can... Uh, listen to it in the future, all the way from the beginning, and you will have an understanding. But at this point, it might be kind of hard to recap everything that I've been talking about for 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> because I think I'm actually going to uh, probably wrap up the stream. Uh, unless there's anything that we want to discuss, I feel like uh, we, we explored the topic pretty thoroughly. Yes, Cronus, we're, we're worshipping Satan. Exactly. Does that mean you're leaving? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> right, right. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> of course, we're not... We're not worshipping Satan. That's not what I'm doing. I was just... I think maybe I was just being a little harsh. Because, you know, to be honest, I do get a little frustrated when somebody comes in and sort of like the middle of the stream and like is asking for information that obviously I've already been discussing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It's not your fault. That's That's on me. I obviously should be more more aware <laughs> of, of the fact that it's um, <laughs> right. Like, oh, like I've been just talking about this for so long, now and I can go back and repeat myself if you'd like. But that's probably not the best use of my time or energy. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm glad you came. I do appreciate you coming and joining and um, maybe I can. Maybe I can try to, to recap it, but I was just about to end the stream. Um, and so do you want me to... I, I can give you a summary so then you can decide if you want to listen to it because it is a really interesting concept and I will try to just do like a really quick overview so you can decide if you want to listen to the stream later on. So hedonism is the belief that um, the main way that we can align with a life well lived and our well-being is by focusing only on freeing ourselves from pain in whatever ways that we can free ourselves from pain and aligning ourselves with pleasure and doing things that bring us pleasure. So um, now we tend to look at that with regard to its extremes, how that could get unhealthy and people can overindulge and become addicted, but it was never really that philosophically. It was more just this belief that aligning yourself with pleasure and removal of pain is what makes you live a good life. It makes you well. And so we explored that idea through lots of different 
right, directions, and we talked about how addictions can happen, and we talked about the different ways that people indulge, and then we also moved into talking about Epicurus, who is somebody who um, proposed a philosophy under hedonism, but it was a much different philosophy that's really focusing on what is actually meaningful, like what is actually pleasurable about existence when when sometimes we don't gain pleasure just from continuing to feed ourselves and take and um, fill ourselves sometimes there's more to it right <clears throat> like I feel like there's so many people wrapped up in criticizing others that should take up hedonism instead right stop being so angry and just start chasing your bliss right and so start living like the the, the horned being in my background picture. I think anything is in extremes is going to negatively affect. <laughs> Thanks for the like. Hello, hello. I'm just <laughs> right. I mean, that might not be ideal when the negative consequences catch up, but. Right, right, yeah. But at the same time, right, we were also talking about this idea of um, in other streams around polarity and how much can we really expect that we're just going to be able to remove the concept of pain from life. Well, we could only do that if we also removed the concept of pleasure because you can't have one without the other, right? There aren't any negative consequences. What are you talking about? Shh. <laughs> Just live fast. Have fun. Do all the fun stuff. <laughs> no, but I, I was explaining, Cronus, that um, I've lived, I've lived in. Uh, what would be considered sort of a hedonist perspective, where it was just like following my bliss, doing what it is that I felt most what was going to make me happiest and um, just, yeah, avoiding things that were potentially difficult or painful and, you know, like making everything all love and light. I'm like, all love and light all the time. <laughs> Are you going to do a live describing your hedonism experience? Um, I don't really feel like it's worthy of a live stream. I traveled all around the world seeing beautiful things. I um, took months off. I spent three months living in Jamaica, just doing absolutely nothing, but just living in Jamaica. I like eating wonderful food and hanging out in beautiful places with cool people, you know, going to reggae concerts and like, going on cruises all around to different Caribbean islands. It's, it was an experience. Yeah, yeah, and it went on for a few years, <laughs> right? And, and eventually I got bored. And now if I do go on vacation, I am so bored. I'm so bored because pretty much all the vacation spots are exactly the same. All the shops look just the same. All the activities are all the same. Right? Like everything is just all the same. Once you've been there and done that, it becomes very, very boring. And then it's like, now what? And what I would find is that when I would actually get back from vacations in line with doing my work again, when I would start seeing my students, when I would go back to doing my hypnotherapy, when I would go back to doing my retreats, I felt so much better. I was on this like spiritual high for a month being back in alignment with my work and being back in alignment with connections and things like that. I've been to South America. I've been to Peru. I went to Peru last year. I went to Machu Picchu. That actually, that trip, I spent two weeks in Mexico, in Cabo, last year. Two weeks in Cabo, and then another um, week in Lima, Cusco, and then Machu Picchu. And that entire time was, I didn't feel like I actually did anything meaningful. I just walked around and looked at stuff and ate stuff and generally had fun. By the time I got home, I was like, I'm just so bored with this. I'm so, yeah. 
No, unless you already naturally live that lifestyle. Yeah, interesting. I just had to tie touch your chain. Yeah, I mean, but you have to understand, before I did this, I actually, like, dropped out of the world. I closed down my clinical practice that I'd been operating for years. I sold off all of my possessions, like, down to just a suitcase. Like, I got to the point where I didn't have any bills, I didn't have an apartment, I didn't have a car, I had nothing. So all I had was just me and travel expenses. And I had opportunities because people were um, providing me with opportunities because of my work. So, I mean, most people, if you stopped focusing on all of the other things you need money for, and you just released all your attachments to everything else, you could do it too, most likely. You could travel the world, you could stay at hostels, you could camp, you could live out of a van and just follow your bliss. You could, if you really wanted to, everyone could do exactly what I did. But most don't because we are focused on success, right? And what that means to the greater society. And that means hard work, building up, maintaining the assets, right? Building up resources, continuing to accumulate more possessions, in increasing status, improving reputation. Yeah, sucking travel. I don't think I don't think so. I think hedonism travel is a big part of the conversation of hedonism. For me at least. Because I'm I can become addicted to novelty. <laughs> like that would be my my extreme, my overindulgence of my hedonism. Like I don't like to stay in one place for very long. I've been a nomad since the end of 2016. So yeah, um three years. Three years since I've had a uh, a location that was home to me and yeah I I would much prefer having everything new all the time seeing something new being around new people being in new beautiful places I don't due to ties I have with family I look after right all the attachments exactly responsibilities yeah but yeah you ultimately that's what it takes people need to be willing to to break attachments and for me I was um, blessed enough that I don't have any dependents I don't have children and I don't have any elderly family members that rely on me that need me to be stable for them that need me to be able to have resources for them that need me to be able to right so that is a difference between me and so somebody else who did have those things in order to follow that their bliss would need to give up their attachments to those people that they love so very unlikely that they're gonna do that right look my family is small mm -hmm. and then so the resources to be able to still follow your bliss in a way even though you might have dependence and sometimes that's that's a benefit right well I mean usually it's a benefit to be able to have the resources to still be able to do the things that you enjoy, even when you have responsibilities to others. Step it if I didn't one would be happy to run around the world several times. Right? Yeah. Right. And yeah, I'm not downing it. Because I'm glad I, I took the time to do it. I'm glad I made I released the attachments that I did and um, but at the end of the most significant period where that's all I was doing and like I said I spent three months straight just in Jamaica doing absolutely nothing absolutely nothing <laughs> other than just hanging out in paradise and um, I ended up yeah continuing out that year even the year and a half after that um, just sort of doing similar things, moving around, but eventually it led to me 40 days in isolation, all by myself, 
no connections to anyone, no electricity. Like I just denied myself every possible distraction or pleasure. I lived on rice and quinoa for 40 days. I didn't eat anything but rice and quinoa. I didn't even have running water. I had to melt snow. I, I So I went through this whole hedonistic thing. And then I went to this whole like extreme hermit self-denial thing right after. Talk about a swing of a pendulum. <laughs> traveling bear looks like, how, thanks for the like bear. One thing I find satisfying about travel is how you travel. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that was after going to um, a psychedelics con conference. So there was a bunch of healthcare providers and doctors and people coming together to talk about psychedelics and how they can be used to um, address issues involving mental health and addictions and uh, stuff like that. And I had listen to this doctor that had been working with uh, ayahuasca talking about how he had observed um, during an ayahuasca journey what seemed like dragons swimming in a woman's DNA and he could sing to them in order to be able to release them and she was like uh, cured of her migraine headaches as a result of it. So he was talking about epigenetics and how sound can influence during those those trance states and I remember being like oh like that's what I want to do like that would bring me pleasure to be able to sing to the dragons in the DNA to heal people like the mystical nature of that was always very very fascinating to me and like stirred my passion so I was like well how do I get that how do I get that tool <laughs> right how do I figure that out and um, after meditating on it for a while I realized that it wasn't anything I was going to learn from any teacher and that the best way to do it would be to go into complete isolation with no distractions for a really really long time and it was the most profound thing like the most healing um inspiring thing I've I've ever done and it wasn't easy but it was exactly what I needed mm-hmm yeah, dragons and swimming through the DNA. And that's why he actually went to the to MAPS afterwards, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And he started talking to them about epigenetics and about how there could be these connections between the epigenome and what's happening in how the the shaman in these journeys is actually influencing the epigenome. Mm-hmm. This long stays with just me and my brain seem unappealing. Yeah, and often if that's the case, it's probably what you need the most for healing and transcendence and actually getting changes that are really going to make you feel satisfied with your life. Because, yeah, when we're afraid of our shadow, right, they call it your shadow self, that part of you you don't want to look at, that part of you that you deny is part of you, that part of you that um, suffers but in hiding, um, the things that you're most ashamed of, like all that stuff sits under the surface and it affects you whether you look at it or not. So going into these places, you, yeah, you're actually prepared when you have to be prepared, but it's, your, your expectations are high. Like going into this, it's a transformative thing that you leave a different person. So you have to want to be a different person to go into it. I had a similar experience during healing touch therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just coming up to an hour now. I think I might have, yeah, I'm feeling like maybe I've exhausted this topic so far. So I'm going to take a little bit of a break for me. I'm still doing a late night stream, so what time? Like one? Yeah. So it'll give me a couple of hours to chill out a little bit, and I will be back around at one for... 
I don't know, sound bath, I guess. Yeah, sound bath. So yeah, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate having these conversations and the opportunity to throw these ideas around with you and explore them and share them and learn from them, learn from you. Catch you later. Thank you. And if I don't end up uh, connecting with you later on tonight, sleep well, sweet dreams, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Bye.